Good morning, Faith Church. How are we doing today? Good, good to see everybody. This is the fifth Sunday of Easter, and this is the third of three confirmation class Sundays. So excited to meet with our confirmands after the worship service today, and our sermon will be tied into what we're talking about. It's about following Jesus, what it means to be a Christian and what the church is. So I look forward to that. Thanks for joining if you're here online. And why don't you give us a comment or a thumbs up to let us know that you're here today. And let's look over here at our camera and wave hello and greet those who are joining Faith Church today online in outer space. Let's remember our mission today. Our mission is to express God's love to all, invite others to know Jesus, and to make faithful disciples. And if you would, make sure your cell phones are silent during our worship service today. Looking forward to our time together. Why don't we start with singing a song of praise as we enter into God's gates today with thanksgiving. Let's stand together as we sing. Amen. We welcome our faith kids and youth that are here today. And because we're talking about following Jesus, our story here in our little video is about one of the first disciples that followed Jesus, one that got called and answered that call. Let's see what our video says for us today. Stories of the Bible. Jesus calls Matthew. This is Jesus. Hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. 
While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. He did many miracles like calming storms and even raised people from the dead. Jesus was in Capernaum and he was walking along when he saw a tax collector named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Tax collectors were hated by everyone because many people thought they were cheaters and sinners. Oh, no one lied to you. Let's get out of here. But Jesus saw this man and said, follow me and be my disciple. Me? Yeah, you. So Matthew got up, left everything, and followed him. Later, Matthew held a banquet in his home hey, yes. with Jesus as the guest of honor. Uh, you are here. Oh, thank you. Many of Matthew's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. Ugh, yuck. Hey, you! But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained to Jesus' disciples, Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Ah, uh, hold on there. When Jesus heard this, he told them, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, Now go on and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So Matthew went on to be one of Jesus' 12 disciples and followed him throughout his time on earth. He even wrote a book in the Bible about Jesus' time on earth, and he served God for the rest of his life. Let's pray. God, we thank you for calling us. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to follow you, just like the first followers. Teach us something new today, we pray in Sunday school. In your name, amen. So today, uh, because it is our Confirmation Sunday, if you're in Confirmation class afterwards, you stay here during uh, the sermon. It's part of the class. And if you're part of Faith Kids, you're welcome to go during our song. Let's sing together. Let's take this time to prepare our hearts for the sermon today. We'll be looking at what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Let's meditate during this song.
Let's pray. Surprising God in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you make all things new. Long ago, you called your church to love beyond all social and cultural differences and gave them the gift of your Holy Spirit to open their hearts and to enact such love. Give us the same spirit of openness that we too might discern new directions in our day for your dream to reconcile and heal all creation. We, give, we bring to you today the joys and the concerns of our hearts. We give you thanks for all the gifts that you've given us, and we take a moment to lift up those for whom we've made special requests for prayer this week. God, we know deep within our hearts that by the power of your loving presence, you're able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or even imagine. O oh God of promise, your word made flesh in Jesus Christ is trustworthy and true. By the power of your Holy Spirit, may it rise up in us this day like a gift from the spring of water of life to refresh our thirsty souls. Amen. Today's text from the lectionary comes from the Gospel of John, John 13, verses 31 through 35, and it just happens to match up quite nicely with our topic of following Jesus today. When Jesus had gone out, he said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Speaking to his disciples, he said, Little children, I am with you only a little while longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so I now say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. But I will give a new commandment to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, 
you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. May God add a blessing to the reading of this word today. So we're asking ourselves during this time, why follow Jesus? We saw in our children's story today, one of the callings of the disciples, and these early disciples, whether they be James and John the fishermen or Matthew the tax collector, the calling was rather simple. Now, we've been talking about confirmation these last several weeks. How many of you have been through confirmation classes before? Raise your hands. So there's all types of ways to do confirmation classes. And some of them are kind of on the shorter, simpler end, and some of them can be rather long and complicated. Some confirmation classes can last one year, two years. And I was looking through one particular curriculum on uh, confirmation. This particular one had, I think it was 63 different topics that got covered in confirmation. All the way from what does it mean to be a disciple? What is the Trinity? Where do I go when I die? What is sin? What is forgiveness? Um, and all types of other questions get asked, questions that come up as we continue on this journey of faith. How many of you think you remember all the right answers to all the confirmation questions in your class? If we were to call you up to the front to share with the group the answers to these tough questions, it might be hard to find those answers. So, we, we here at Faith have kind of gone on the simpler end of confirmation, and that is to view it as the beginning of a lifelong journey. These are the first steps that we're taking on our own, deciding that we're going to live a life of faith. And you're going to have the whole rest of your life to answer all these questions and it looks like there's still some work to be done. If we can't answer all 63 of those questions now, <laughs> I guess you're going to be sticking around a little bit longer. Well, we're excited, and we're going to welcome our confirmants today. Jameer, Brianna, Destiny, Elijah, Jalen, Michael, Richard, Noah, and Peyton. All are in confirmation class. And I've, I've really enjoyed our time after church, sitting and talking, sharing our thoughts and our questions with each other. It's been a real joy, and I look forward to next Sunday when we have our confirmation ceremony where you get the chance to say, yes, I would like to be a follower of Jesus myself. Uh, if you would, uh, let's go to the next, uh, the next slide on the screen here. So we're going to start like we have the last few weeks. These are two very important parts of the ceremony that we'll be having next week. The first is this opening prayer, and in this opening prayer we can see kind of the essence of what we are doing when we say that we want to be confirmed. This prayer says, O oh God, my God, and that means in the confirmation process God becomes yours and you become God's known to me in Jesus Christ, and we've talked about how God is unknowable. Yet if God chooses to reveal himself like we believe he has in Jesus Christ, then we can start to get a little bit of an understanding of things that cannot be understood. I give myself to you as your own, to love and to serve you faithfully all the days of my life. And that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus is giving our lives to God and serving with other believers. Let's look at the next slide. And this is a question that gets asked to those that are in confirmation class. And this has to do with being a part of a community of followers of Jesus. Do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people? And when we say family of God's people, it means all of us sitting here in this room today are followers of Jesus. Sharing regularly in worship 
of God and enlisting in the work of this local church as it serves this community and the world. And those are two big parts of what it means to be in the community. It means to praise God and worship God and commune with God. And it also means taking the life change that we've experienced and sharing it with people around us. How many know that in this world today, there are a lot of needs? There are a lot of things that are broken. There are a lot of things that need fixing. There's a lot of darkness and despair. There's pain. And just like Jesus came with solutions and with love and with healing, that's our job as followers to continue that mission. So those are two things that we're going to see next week. And essentially, that's what we're preparing our hearts to answer. We looked in our first Sunday as confirmation being the beginning of the journey, as I've mentioned. And I talked to you about uh, passing the baton. So we are following in the footsteps of Jesus. And the disciples followed the first disciples like Matthew and John and James followed in the footsteps of Jesus. And then it was up to those disciples to pass on the word to the next generation and for those to pass on the word to the next generation. So we are passing on the word to you, confirmands, and one day it will be your job to pass on that word to the next generation. So far, we've done pretty good. 2,000 years of passing the baton, and we're still passing it. And it might be a little bit of a messy race. Maybe we even drop the baton, but we pick it back up, and we keep trying. And for 2,000 years, we've been passing this baton and people have been uh, offered the chance to follow Jesus and they've taken it and so we continue that that race one of the things that is a head scratcher and the the hardest probably of all questions is who is God what is God and and we looked at God being unknowable that means God is outside of time and outside of space outside of creation And that doesn't seem to make logical sense, yet at the same time we feel that this must be true. And if we have faith, we hold on to that and believe it to be true. That means God is the source of everything around us. And God keeps life going. And ultimately ultimately we believe that God is a good God and has good intentions for all of us. And we looked at what the Bible is. And the Bible is... Not just a book, but the Bible is a whole library of books. And what these books are about is they're about the experiences that people had with God and with other God followers. And when they were inspired, they wrote down some words that stayed preserved. And those are words that have been around for maybe 3,000 years. And we're still reading those words because... They're so important and meaningful. So we have the Bible, and then we look at who the, per, who the person of Jesus is. And I've enjoyed watching our kids' videos these, these last several months. Can you tell me what Jesus sounds like? <laughs> Very good. That's the exact answer I was looking for. <laughs> I've, I've enjoyed watching, uh, there's, a, there's a new series on the life of Jesus called The Chosen. And it's a series that is, is still being uh, filmed uh, as time goes on. It's being filmed in a way that's called crowdsourced, so as people raise the money, then they'll continue to film. Their goal is to do seven seasons of the life of Jesus and Jesus' disciples and to reach one billion people with uh, this this uh, film this series and it's a it's a really neat modern take on the life of Jesus and when you meet the character of Jesus in this series he kind of feels like the character that we see as a cartoon up here on the screen he's just easy to relate to and he's friendly and he's open uh he 
in, in some other ways when we describe Jesus, Jesus could be a little bit intimidating because he's holy and shining and halos and almost seems like not really a friend that we would approach, but somebody that we might be, you know, a little standoffish about. But I think when we think about Jesus and we look at the love of God, we're probably probably would see somebody very approachable and somebody that uh, would really share easily the love of God. So who was Jesus? Jesus, we believe as Christians, is God in the flesh. And what that means is, is that God has been outside of creation, outside of time and space for a long, long time. And in Jesus, what we see is God wants to be as close as possible to the things and the people that he's created. So he decides to become enfleshed in this person of Jesus Christ. And if we look at uh, John, one of the disciples of Jesus, he wrote down these words to describe the person of Jesus. He says, And the Word, which is Jesus before time and space, and the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we've seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. That's who Jesus was that John experienced. And then he says these words in verse 18. No one has ever seen God. No one. It's the only son, God himself, who's close to the father's heart and who has made him known. So the unknowable now becomes known because of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came, Jesus spent all his time teaching and healing, and teaching and healing. And if you've ever heard the phrase, the kingdom of God, this is the topic that Jesus taught about over and over and over and over again. Jesus taught a little bit about himself, but mostly he talked about the kingdom of God. And what that means is he's kind of showing us what this life was meant to be, the way that God has created this life for us. It's the way God uh, shows himself through creation. So we can see in the message of the kingdom of God, what God intended. God intended for this world to be full of love. God intended for us to participate in this life through trust, which is not always easy, amen? It's not easy to trust, but if we trust in the kingdom of God, and if we trust in God, then that means even if we might get hurt, even if it might be scary, we can still go through this life ultimately trusting in God. There's a little story that Jesus told, a little parable, where he talked about how we need to trust. And what happens is if we find ourselves not trusting, something happens inside of us that's called worry. Has anybody ever experienced worry before? Worry is that feeling like, I'm just not sure I'm ready to trust because things might not be looking the way I want them to look. But Jesus tells us, just like a commandment, just like do not murder and do not steal, those were commandments from God. That's the way that we're supposed to live if we want to experience the way that uh, God created this life to be. Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry. It's probably one of the rules that we break the most. I know I do that on my end. Don't worry. But when we feel worry crop up, this is a chance for us to go in prayer to God and say, God, help me to trust. Help me to trust. I need help to trust. Jesus uh, told us that we need to serve other people. Uh, when we look at the Last Supper of Jesus, when he broke bread and they drank wine together, and it was the last time that they met as a group of 
Jesus followers before Jesus went on to be arrested and then crucified and died and rose again. This last supper, uh, at the same time, something Jesus did for them is he washed their feet. Now for us, that seems really, really weird. It's not something we tend to do to one another. Has anybody ever washed somebody else's feet before? Hmm. It's probably not something you did last night or yesterday. It's not something we do very often. But this is the way that Jesus said, I want to serve you and I want to love you. I want to think about what you need. And I want to see if, with God's help, I can help to meet your needs. And he does this through things like serving. And then there is another command that um, Jesus gives to us that's not easy. It might be a little bit easier than not worrying, but it's pretty hard too. And that is he commands us to forgive one another. Forgive one another. And the hardest time that we have when it comes to forgiving is if we feel like somebody does not deserve to be forgiven because they're not even sorry. They might have even tried to hurt us or do something wrong to us. And what Jesus says to us, if we're going to understand the kingdom of God, if we're going to live this life the way that he created it to be, that means we have to forgive each other. Forgiveness is a part of love, and it's a part of trust. It's all tied together. If we have people that we love, we probably trust them. And if we hang around with each other long enough, we're probably going to do something where we need forgiveness. We might say something we don't really mean, or we might do something we don't really mean, or we might say something we do mean and try to hurt the other person or make them feel bad or feel, feel stupid or silly. But Jesus says we need to forgive each other. We can't hold things against each other. And there's a, there's a story, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, I think it's from maybe the 1600s, 1700s, it's called Pilgrim's Progress. And it's the story about a Christian who's following this path of Jesus. And the way it describes this journey is this pilgrim, this follower of Jesus, is carrying a backpack or carrying a burden. And as he goes on the journey, the backpack gets heavier and heavier and it's harder to take steps forward and it's harder to continue day after day on this journey and this is similar to what happens if we don't forgive if we don't forgive then we take our bitterness or our pain or our anger and we put it in our backpack and then we walk along this life's journey and then when the next thing happens we put that in our backpack and then we put the next thing in our backpack if you ever ever become this person or been around somebody that's just really, really, really not happy, it might be because they're carrying a very heavy backpack and have not experienced forgiveness. I remember meeting one of my roommates. I had a, a grandfather that I met, and he was um, he was very old, almost a hundred. He was very close to being a hundred years old. And when I met him for the first time, his face didn't look happy. And it looked like he had been unhappy for a very, very long time. It, can, can you make your most angry face? Make your most angry face. Now, try to hold that for 50 years <laughs> or 100 years and if you hold it that way like mom said it will stick <laughs> well god bless him this this grandpa he was determined to make it to 100 years old that was his reason to live i'm going to make it to 100 but it was a hard journey, and his backpack seemed to be very, very heavy. So we forgive because Jesus wants us to have a light journey. Jesus even says, 
take my backpack on your shoulders. He says, take my yoke upon you. He says, my burden is light because it's all about forgiveness. And it might not be easy, but if we do it, life becomes much easier. So Jesus teaches us about the way that God has created this world. Jesus has some sayings that shows that the way that God created things is not easy, but it will give us a light burden. He teaches us things like turn the other cheek. That's about forgiveness. He says, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me. That's a hard one. Anybody want to sell everything that they have and give it to the poor and follow Jesus? And then, of course, he says, don't worry. So these are, these are teachings of Jesus. And learning the teachings of Jesus and practicing them can take the rest of our lives. Jesus also in the, at the Last Supper when he was with them, when he held up the cup of wine, he told them, this represents a new covenant that I'm making with you. Now, the people that were around Jesus and the people that came before Jesus were familiar with this word covenant. This word covenant means you make a very serious relationship promise with one another. You love one another, you trust one another, you live your lives together, and when you make a covenant, it's the strongest promise that a person can make. And God made a covenant with his people, starting with Abraham, and on throughout every generation after Abraham. And when Jesus came to the table, he said, I'm going to make a new covenant promise between God and God's people. And the big difference that we see in this covenant later, especially the Apostle Paul, the follower of Jesus, he really knew how to describe this new covenant. What this new covenant meant is anybody and everybody got to be a follower of God, got to be in a special covenant relationship with God. Because before that, you had to be related to Abraham. Anybody familiar with something like Ancestry.com and your family tree? And maybe you get to find out who your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents are. Well, back in Jesus' day, if you wanted to know if you were a child of God, you needed to go to your family tree and you just hope that one of these people way, 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 way back was Abraham. And if it was, you're good. You're a part of the covenant. But if Abraham wasn't in your family tree, sorry. There are special relationships with God and you can't have one. So Jesus, when he came, says, we need to change some things here. We need to fix some things. And what he said is anybody and everybody that wants to follow can be a follower. That's, that's part of the good news of this new covenant. And then lastly, what we see in the life and ministry of Jesus is Jesus does a great job of bringing all types of people together. Younger people, older people, people with all kinds of different backgrounds. Some people were religious, some people weren't. Some people were rich, some people were poor. And even today, if we look at all the people that consider themselves to be followers of Jesus... There's all kinds of people following Jesus today, all over the world, all ages, with skin colors that are different, and heights that are different, and weights that are different, and different types of education, and different types of jobs. We can all be followers of Jesus, and we're brought together because of Jesus. Now, we mentioned this word just briefly, and that is the word trinity. And this is something that you could talk about for years and years and still not totally figure it out. And what that means is it's a way to describe how Jesus is the Son of God and Jesus is God. And then the Holy Spirit is also God, too. Does that mean we worship three gods or we have three different gods? No, it doesn't mean that. It means there's one God, but 
it's kind of we kind of understand it in three different ways. So we have God the Father outside of time, outside of space, unknowable. Uh, and then we have Jesus, the Son of God, that's God in creation, a part of creation, bringing us a, the revelation of who this unknowable God is. And then we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is kind of this God in between the outside time and space and inside all of creation moving and flowing the bible talks about the holy spirit being like the wind goes wherever it wants you can't tell when it's coming or when it's going the holy spirit's described this way also in the gospel of john it says but the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name will teach you all things and remind you of everything that i've said so Jesus knew that he wasn't going to be with his disciples forever. He knew that even if he died and, and raised again, he would still ascend back to the Father and they would be on their own. So Jesus said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. So we don't see the Holy Spirit, but it's God's presence in our lives. We can feel the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspires us. And Jesus tells us here that the Holy Spirit will teach us and remind us of all the stuff that Jesus taught to us. So that's what the Trinity is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God uh, in this mysterious combination. And that's what we believe as Christians. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to follow? It was about six years ago that my family took a trip to the middle of the state to Avon Park and we were going to this house that was full of dogs to find our little Yorkie rescue that we wanted to adopt and I don't remember why exactly we wanted a Yorkie but we decided we did I guess because it was a, it was we we had just previously had a Labrador Retriever that was 85 pounds and shed all over the house and uh, was hard to walk if he wanted to chase squirrels at the same time. <laughs> so maybe something a little smaller that couldn't drag us down the street and maybe a dog that didn't shed all over the house. And so we were looking at a Yorkie, and we went into this house where there was all these rescue dogs, and then we saw this not-so-little Yorkie come around the corner. And Scooter back then was seven years old, and instead of being about 10 pounds as a Yorkie, sometimes a little less, a little bit more, Scooter was about 20 pounds. And later on, what we found out, what we discovered is the that he's actually a silky terrier which is half Yorkie and half Australian terrier and this is back in the day they took Yorkies to Australia and then they bred them with the Australian terriers and they needed I think in Australia at the time they needed their Yorkies to be a little bit tougher than the average Yorkie because you know, in Australia, there's big snakes and there's big rats and there's like all kinds of dangerous animals and creatures and they needed the dog to be there to protect them. And so that's where this silky, t you may see pictures of this long silky hair that goes down to the, to the floor. Well, we keep ours with a buzz cut that looks kind of like his daddy's. <laughs> So we got we adopted Scooter and Scooter's now 13 years old and he he looks just as young as if he were 2 years old and he's got lots of energy and he loves us to pieces and he wants to be with us all the time and when we brought him home for the first time the first thing he did was he got out of the car and he ran down the street <laughs> and I had to chase him I guess he was trying to go back home, so I finally caught him, and, uh, and then we took him into the house. Well, that week, my lovely and supportive wife decided it was a good time to go to Atlanta to work for a week right after we adopted this, this new dog. So 
Uh, it was already on the schedule, I'm sure. And, <laughs> and, and so I got to be daddy for Scooter for that first week. And probably that's what made it stick, that I became the center of Scooter's universe. And it hasn't changed since then. And uh, one thing that we found out is that Scooter, especially for me, is a really good follower. He's the best of followers. Everywhere I go, no matter where it is, Scooter's going to follow. And <laughs> if... If he, for some reason, loses me, he doesn't use his eyes to find me. He uses his nose to find me. So sometimes it's silly. You'll see him frantically smelling around the house to find out, where did he go? I should be following him right now. So this is an example of a follower. Now, in, in, we just moved to this new place, and in it we have these wood floors and it seems like we need to get his nails trimmed because you can hear him following everywhere click 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 so you'll never forget that you're being followed by scooter this is this is kind of we we ask ourselves when jesus met john and met james and met matthew for the first time and they didn't know each other John and James, they were fishing. And they had just finished fishing all night long. And Jesus just walks up to the boat and he says, Hey guys, my name's Jesus. Why don't you follow me? And they did. The Bible says they, they stopped working and they left everything behind and they followed Jesus. And the same with Matthew, the tax collector. Now he wasn't... He wasn't he didn't have the type of job where he would get all smelly and, and fishy. You know, if you're a fisherman, you probably smell like fish. And you're a hard worker, and probably your hands probably show it. Well, Matthew, uh, he was used to writing in books and collecting money and maybe making threats. <laughs> that was his job. And as a tax collector, that meant... The Romans, who were there kind of in charge of everybody, wanted to have everybody's money, and so they used tax collectors to go get it from people. So nobody liked people like Matthew. But Jesus went up to him one day, and he said the same thing. He says, hey, Matthew, my name's Jesus. Come follow me. And it says he dropped what he did, and he followed after him. So how do we follow today? Because we're not going to have... You know, the physical Jesus come up to us and, and ask us by name, hey, come and follow me. And, and what does that mean? Does that mean we do like Scooter and just kind of follow Jesus everywhere, wherever he goes? Maybe you've had some friends in school. Have you ever had friends in school and they seem to just follow you around wherever they go? Or maybe you've followed people around. We want to be with one another. So to be a follower can mean a few different things. One is it means... I'm going to be doing a lot of teaching. So listen to what I'm teaching. Try to learn and understand it. And then try to practice it. It also means, and Jesus said this. This was a really hard saying. He says, if you're going to follow me, you need to take up your cross and follow me. Now we know by the story of Jesus that when he took up the cross, that meant he was going to die. And so Jesus is essentially saying life is going to be hard and sometimes you're going to have the greatest of all challenges. But watch what I do. Even when I face the biggest of challenges, even death, I still trust in God. I still hold on to the message of the kingdom of God and I still believe that there's something good to come out of this. We need to be able to go through life and face those hardest of challenges when we follow and then the last thing that jesus describes in following is he says following is kind of like a sheep and shepherd and a shepherd will just call out to the sheep now i don't know what they do whether they go you know you hear pig farmers go like suey and then maybe you have uh i don't i don't know what the uh what the shepherds do uh, maybe they go bah bah and then Everybody follows. I don't know. I doubt it. But, 
but apparently they use their voice. And when the sheep hear the voice, they follow after the voice. So Jesus used this as an example. He says, I'm going to be teaching you and talking to you. Even after I'm gone through the Holy Spirit, I'm going to keep talking to you. So you need to listen. And when you hear my voice, go in that direction. Follow the example. So this is what it means to be a follower. And then briefly, let's look at what it means to be the church. Basically, the church is a community of Jesus followers. It's a bunch of people like us sitting here. We are the church. The church is people. It's a group of people who follow Jesus. And when we come together, we follow Jesus in different ways. One is we praise God through singing, through prayers. We go back and read the scriptures. We read the things in the Bible, the teachings there. And then hopefully when we come into this place and we come together, we're listening. We're listening for the Holy Spirit. What's God saying to me today? When we're in our worship services, we're not just here to sing some words or to read them from the screen, but we're here to, to listen to what God is telling us in this song. And when we pray, we're not just listening to the words that are prayed, but we're also listening, is God speaking to me? Is he speaking to my heart? And it's not just the words that I say, whether it be stories or teachings, but it's God also speaking at the same time. So we come together in worship to praise and to listen. And then we also come to build our friendships with one another. Jesus said we should love one another. And the way that everybody's going to know that you're Christians, that you're followers of Jesus, is because you love each other so much. And so we need, we need to practice. How do we love each other? We spend time together. We get to know each other. We do things for one another. We forgive one another. <laughs> we trust one another. We work together. So those are some things that we do. And then, of course, we serve, just like Jesus washed feet we're looking for needs around us, whether it be in this place or maybe there's some needs of people in Port St. Lucie or beyond in the world. Can we help to serve people? That's what the church is all about. So being confirmed means deciding on your own to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus' teachings, Jesus' example, and to follow Jesus' voice through the Holy Spirit. It means having a faith of your own that's nurtured and that grows from day to day. We keep learning. We keep growing. It means becoming a part of a community of Jesus followers, as well as having your own personal experiences and relationship with God. There's an abundance of joy and peace in following Jesus. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. Joy and peace in following Jesus. And following Jesus also means carrying a cross. It means facing life's most difficult challenges while trusting God and believing that God's eternal life and love is stronger than anything, even death. Are we ready to follow Jesus. Let's meditate on these words as we sing together.
These are some different ways that we can be involved as Jesus followers in the life of the church. We have a special congregational meeting next Sunday after our worship service, and we've sent out a letter that hopefully you've read, and please take the opportunity this week if you have any questions, concerns, suggestions, uh, you can talk with me or somebody on the steering committee, uh, but we'll be having that special meeting and vote next week. Also next week will be, as we mentioned, our confirmation class, and that will be uh, in the middle of our service. We look forward to that. And we have our last confirmation class today right after the worship service. In the newsletter, there is an announcement about our per capita dues. And what this is, is if you are a member of Faith Church, this is the, one of the ways that our local church supports the infrastructure and the programs of our broader denomination. That's both in the regional Florida conference and in the National United Church of Christ. And it's just $15 per member per year. And uh, we try to collect those before June or during June. So if you haven't done that already, you can just mark an envelope uh, as you give your offering, or you can also go to the church's website and underneath the different funds to choose from, you can pick per capita uh, support. We thank you for your participation in that. Our Sisters in Faith are uh, working to organize another partnership opportunity with CareBag. CareBag is an organization that helps the homeless and vulnerable, vulnerably housed folks across the Treasure Coast by uh, providing proper hygiene and mobile showers. Over 60 showers per day are provided through uh, CareBag. And you can help if you would like by uh, during this month and in the month of June, you can bring hygiene items. And if you want to pick up a list of some of these items that we're looking for, that's gonna be in the lobby and we'll collect those for the next several weeks. Thank you, Sisters in Faith, for organizing that for us. Bible study is Wednesday at 10. Our newsletter goes out at the end of the week and next week at 9 a.m. in person and online, we'll be meeting again for our worship service. Let's say happy birthday this week to Diane Hurling and Karen Dirksen and Carl Norman, all having birthdays this week. Happy birthday to those folks. Let's wish a happy birthday. And we say happy anniversary and congratulations to Janet and Ken Firestone celebrating an anniversary this week. So let's congratulate them. And if you would, let's look over here and let's send our love to our online viewers and, and fellow followers of Jesus at Faith Church. Glad that you guys are able to join online today. As we leave this shared time and space, let's make a commitment to stay connected with one another. Let's dedicate our offerings for the mission that God has given us here at Faith Church. Let's enter into God's week with this blessing. Loving God, we give you thanks for the ministry of reconciliation to which you've called us in the name of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Accept our gifts for your mission to heal all creation. May they be a testament to your love for us as we share them in love for you. O oh God, you have made each of us a new creation. Give us the grace to grow in faith, hope, love, and justice. We pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand together for our closing song. They'll know we're Christians by our love.
going to be.